Foundation based in Chicago with staff and volunteers in Washington, DC, New York, Boston, Texas, Canada, and other locations. The organization, which was incorporated in 1999, grew out of advocacy efforts on the human rights abuses experienced in Bosnia and later Kosovo during the breakup of the former Yugoslavia. At that time, it was instrumental in shaping the discourse around the, the quote, genocide debate and campaign to declare rape as a war crime in international law. And right now, Save Uyghur is a project of justice for all. I'm Aiden Anwar, your moderator for this webinar, and I currently serve as the outreach manager for the Save Uyghur campaign. I'm also uh, an Uyghur American, so this uh, particular webinar, you know, is a, is a topic close to my heart, as well as I'm sure other viewers as well. And before I introduce our presenter, I would like to point out a few housekeeping rules so we can have a streamlined experience, inshallah. At all times during the webinar, please keep yourselves on mute so we can have an un uninterrupted session. And you can also use a chat box that will pop up on your right hand side if you press the chat button on the bottom of your screen. And I will take all your questions uh, and we can get them answered at the end, inshallah. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Abdurrahman Latif. Abdurrahman is a PhD student in religion at Columbia University. He is interested in vernacular religion and traditions of storytelling. He also holds a master's in religion from the Harvard Divinity School. And personally, I also know him uh, because we went to undergrad at Duke together. Uh, and uh, mashallah, he's been kind of known or uh, he was known in MSA as kind of like the storyteller and, uh, and really passionate about history. And so we're excited to have him uh, share that passion today uh, in regards to uh, a nation that is currently undergoing genocide and whose, and whose history is currently, currently being systematically wiped out. And without further ado, I'd like to ask Abdurrahman to start his presentation. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, and hope you can see what I can see as well. Uh, all right, let's get started, inshallah. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about a land in rhythm with the Prophet's heart, a brief history of Islam in East Turkestan. When speaking about East Turkestan, what I'm referring to is China-occupied Xinjiang, the territory that is occupied by uh, Uyghurs and other Turkic peoples, a land really that's been Muslim and experienced Islam for over a thousand years at this point. Uh, it's called in many historical sources, the region, at least the majority of the region is referred to as Alta Shahir or Yedi Shahir, six cities or seven cities in Turkic, uh, referring to major polities, but really it was more than just a few cities. So inshallah, let's get started uh, first by talking about you know, why should we study this history? Why is the history of you know, religion and religious experience in this particular area actually important? So as I'm sure all of you are aware who are watching this, East Turkestan, Uyghurs, uh, the, the region is under siege at the moment. Uh, the Chinese state is enacting systematic oppression of the local population. Uh, people are being divorced from their faith, from their history, from their entire cultural kind of paradigm and way of looking at the world. This is actually a strategy of genocide. Uh, and a strategy not just of genocide of today, but even we, something we see that happened previously in forms of slavery before, in forms of domination. When you want to change a population, when you want to completely dominate it, you have to erase its identity. And history, the stories we tell about ourselves are key to forming our identity, to making us into who we are. And if you remove that history, if you remove those origins or the imaginings about origins, people become a blank slate and you can do whatever you want with them. This is what the colonial paradigm is. When you know, different colonial empires entered into places, they made it blank spaces. The Indians don't really have history, it's just poetry. Or the you know, East Africans have no history. And once you make them have no history, you can do whatever you want with them. So that's, I think the first reason, you know, for an activist reason like to preserve identity, to further identity, uh, to stop this erasure, learning this history is important. Secondly, uh, I am Muslim, and that's what a big drive behind why you know, I care about these issues. And God says in the Quran, and I think it's a lesson that even you know, non-Muslims can appreciate, that the Quran says, and of his signs, the creation of the heavens and the earths and the diversity of your languages and your colors, indeed, and in that are signs for those of knowledge. So diversity of language, of cultures, of peoples is a sign of the divine. It's something beautiful. This multiplicity we see in the world, this great diversity we see in the world is a sign of this divine unity. 
And every different faith, every different culture, every different culture is a different way of pointing towards the divine, of enacting this sort of prophetic paradigm in the world. Uh, and to lose it and is a, number one, a tragedy, but also for those that are even not a part of it, it, it there's something can be learned from it. Uh, and then, of course, as we'll see throughout this presentation, uh, the people of East Turkestan made significant contributions to Islamic civilization. They were a big part of this, you know, imagined ummah that we talk so often about. And finally, it's kind of beautiful and entertaining and amazing in its own right. Uh, there's constantly filled with surprises, moments of awe. Uh, it's something just for the sheer joy of it that is worth being known. So, inshallah, let's get started at the beginning. Uh, and when I talk about the beginning, I'm talking about those sort of <laughs> hazy uh, origin stories. So hagiographies, which are biographies of saintly figures, are known for being a bit historically sketch, you might say. Uh, they don't always tell you what exactly actually happened. But what we, uh, you know, people who study these sorts of, uh, as historians, as scholars of religion, can learn from them is how people viewed themselves, what people thought was important about who they were. It may not tell us exactly how the first Oilers or the first Turkic peoples of East Turkestan became Muslim, but it gives us an idea into what being Muslim meant at a later period. So Satuk Bukhra Khan was a member of the Karakhanid kind of tribal confederation, a sort of Central Asian, uh, you know, in, in modern day East Turkestan as well, tribal confederation that eventually founded an empire, the Karakhanid Empire, that was a major Muslim empire in the 11th century through the 13th century. And so Sadat Burra Khan, according to legend, was the first figure in this lineage, in this dynasty, to become Muslim and to make the others Muslim, to kind of propagate Islam. And so the account I'm going to be telling you today uh, comes from a I think 18th century hagiography of the figure, but it resonates. It has details that are, you know, from hundreds of years earlier as well. So it may not be telling us exactly what happened in the 10th century when he passed away and when he lived, but it can tell us a lot about how people later on viewed this figure and what it can even mean for us today. So the hagiography begins, you know, going way back to the time of the prophet, peace be upon him, where the prophet, peace be upon him, according to the story, is on the ascension. He's on the mirage. He goes to the heavens and he's by the throne of God. And from near the throne of God, he sees in the distance these figures, the different prophets who have lived, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and he recognizes them. But he also sees this fellow, according to this story, he sees this character who he doesn't recognize as a prophet. So he asks God, he says, oh, you know, oh Allah, who is this person? And he receives the response, this is Satuk Bughra Khan. You know, he's a, you know, a leader. He's the person who will bring Islam to Turkestan. That's how the text refers to it. Uh, and again, this is not an account. This story we don't find in the hadith, we don't find in the uh, you know, traditional sources, but it's again, an imagined account with great weight. So the prophet hears God say this, and he recognizes this person's going to bring Islam to this territory. And as the text says in Jeff Eden's translation, the prophet listened to Gabriel's good news. Gabriel conveys this on behalf of God, and he rejoices. He praised God, and he raised his blessed hands, and he prayed, thank God that Turkestan is in accord with my heart. Or you can translate the Chagatai that it's written in other ways that thank God that Turkestan is united with my heart, that my heart is made whole by Turkestan. Or in our very poetic translation, that the land is in rhythm with the Prophet's heart. So after this you know, origin story, it goes into the story of Satuk Burkhan himself. He's a youth, maybe no more than 12 years old, and he has an encounter, well, perhaps he's hunting, with a sort of strange figure that tells him that you, you are Satuk Bukhra Khan and you're going to become Muslim someday. That you're going to accept this faith. And he has no idea what Islam is at this point. And he tells this figure who approached him that, you know, I don't understand what you're talking about. I'll see when I'm older and more aware. And according to the story, this figure is Khidr. Khidr is a Quranic figure, a figure who features in many Muslim legends and uh, folklore uh, as like, you know, a figure, an immortal figure spreading the word of God, if you will. It's a trope character for these types of stories. So after Satuk Bukhra Khan enacts with this figure, uh, some years later, he travels and he meets a merchant from a Samanid background. So the Samanids were a Muslim Persian empire that occupied much of Central Asia at this time. So he's traveling a bit. He encounters a group of people from this empire, a group of Muslims, essentially, and he sees them praying. And when he sees them praying, he's astonished by you know, the acts of prostration, by the movements that they're making. And he asks, you know, the prayer leader who became a teacher of his, what are you doing? And the man says, you know, this is Islam. I'm worshiping one God. 
that we are aware that there's only one God, one Lord in existence. And at this moment, according to the legend, Sadat Burr Khan immediately accepts Islam. He remembers what he'd been told as a kid and he accepts the faith. And then after he accepts the faith, he starts asking questions. Okay, who is this prophet? Who is this? Who is that? He starts asking all these questions and learning about the faith. So it goes to tell us that this conception, how did Islam begin? How was Islam imagined? First, it starts off very simply as there being one God. And then immediately the prophet is important. Uh, that we can see that there are these sort of uh, tropes that f fit in with different sort of Sufi ideas of Khidr, of you know, other sorts of figures that feature in this type of self-imagining. So after uh, Sadaq Bukhra Khan becomes Muslim, he begins to learn how to pray, and he teaches his followers how to pray. But when he, and he says, come in secret at night, and we shall read the Quran and perform the namaz. This is what his teacher tells him, and I'll teach you how to do this. So he learns how to pray, his followers learn how to pray, but when he goes back to like, his confederation, to his tribe, he knows that Islam is not going to be accepted amongst them. The people are pagan. They are against the idea of Islam. It's a foreign faith to them. They, they don't like it at this point. So he hides his faith. And his, his uncle or his father, I guess, depending on the narration, hears a rumor that Sadaq Burra Khan became Muslim. And he's very upset with him. So he commands Sadaq Burra Khan. He says, I want you to make this idol temple. I want you to be the person that builds up this idol temple. Like you're the lead you know, architect and laborer for this project. And he's conflicted, Sadaq Burra Khan. He doesn't want to build an idol temple. He only worships one God. So he prays to God. And I think this is a very powerful moment in the story. He prays to God and he asks him, he said, oh God, I'm going to make this in the intention that I'm building a mosque a place of worship for you. you know, I'm going to you know, you hide you know, my faith for the sake of protection, for the sake of survival right now, but my intention is to praise only you. And so he, you know, he helps to build this temple and he's building it so furiously that eventually his uncle or his father, whoever it is, gives in and says, okay, okay, we believe you. You're probably not Muslim. But later on, the circumstances change and Sadat Burhan builds up more followers and he's able to kind of you know, take over and then eventually kind of expand this you know, burnishing, this fledgling empire, and allow the faith to be practiced more freely. And so in this story, uh, I find personally there's a great resonance for today, where the people of East Turkestan Uyghurs, have a lot of difficulty practicing today. That sometimes Quran has to be whispered, uh, that prayers have to be done in secret, just as Sata Bura Khan had to do. But inshallah, there come a time where open practice will again be predominant. And we can see over here the tomb of Sata Bura Khan. So let's talk a little bit now, you know, more, I guess, material aspect of history about the Karakhanids who I mentioned. So the Karakhanids, again, Muslim empire from the 10th century into the uh, 13th century. Uh, and th they were operating predominantly in what is now East Turkestan. And then they eventually had another capital in Kyrgyzstan. Their territory extended into much of Uzbekistan, really this larger Central Asian region. Uh, and we can often tell when it comes to empires, how an empire conceived of itself what they thought about who they were and how they wanted to convey authority and who they were speaking to as rulers through their coins. Because coins are objects that literally everyone has it in their pocket or every, people are like picking these up. You know, they're, they're items that move. So it tells us, number one, who are they trading with, who are they trying to contact, but also how do they want to express authority to their local subjects. And so we have before us a Karakhanid coin. And there was a Karakhanid workshop that I'm getting this from. They kind of did the parsing of this coin. I have the details here. This coin is actually silver. It's not multicolored like you can see over here. Uh, they painted it so we can tell you know, which uh, words go to where. But, and we can, but immediately we can tell, looking at this coin, those who have experienced with numismatics the study of coins, that it is very much a typical, in many ways, Abbasid coin, but with a few twists that make it also locally grounded. And this is a theme I'm gonna keep returning to throughout this talk, that Islam in East Turkestan was simultaneously connected with the wider whole, was simultaneously universal and ummah oriented, but also locally nuanced, you know, out of this, this local flavoring, this local beauty. So we can see in this coin, it says uh, on this left side, uh, in the name, like it, it mentions where the coin was struck. So the storm was struck in Yarkhan, one of the major cities of the Tar uh, Tarim Basin. It mentions the year that it was struck, you know, the fourth century, uh, the fifth century Hijri, excuse me. And then, it, as is in all Abbasid coins, uh, it mentions la ilaha illallah wahdu la shrika lahu. So it mentions a formula of faith. There is no God but God, and there, he's one and unique, and there's no partner for him. And then, this is where the unique twist comes into play. Uh, in this purple, it actually has a phrase in Old Oivar. So it's a title of like one of the rulers uh, in Old Oivar. Uh, and this is done, again, because it's speaking to an audience that's 
you know, Muslim empires in the distance, an audience that's Islamizing slowly and steadily, and then also, you know, talking to this older history as well. It's this kind of trans, this is not just a transition point, not syncretism, but kind of, you know, embracing this sort of uh, local milieu, if you will. And we see on the other side of the coin, it has an ayah of the Quran around the side of the coin. So Muhammad Rasulullah So the verse of the Quran says Muhammad is the messenger of God. God sent him with guidance and the deen of truth, the religion of truth, that he may, you know, that it be made apparent uh, upon all the faiths and, you know, and it's condemning the pagans. And then afterwards, we see the title of the uh, Abbasid ruler. So the Karakhanids were their own empire, but they gave homage to the Abbasid caliph in Baghdad, who had no real temporal power at this time, it was sort of a figurehead. And then it mentions the local ruler's name. And we can see in the local ruler's name, Nasr al-Dawla is the first part of the name. So Nasr al-Dawla is a type of means like the helper of the, uh, of the government, of the state. Uh, and when it says this, it's using a title that's very common among Muslims in the Middle, in the middle Ages. But it adds, again, some local nuance, Qadir Khan bin Bughra Khan. So this term Khan that I mentioned is an old Turkic word meaning like a king or a ruler. So we see this language entering even into the Arabic. We see this local understanding of rule, of being a chieftain mixed in with this Islamic notions of a sultan, of a different type of ruler. And they're all combined. And over here, there's an Abbasid coin for reference. You can see how similar they look. So during the Karakhanid empire, so we can see this Islamic kind of language that's being used, but it's not just at the you know, elite level of like economic, uh, discourse that we see Islam, you know, on the rise, but also in the literary production of the Karakhanids. So a key figure that many of you, uh, I think, will recognize uh, from this time period is Yusuf Khas Hajib. So Yusuf Khas Hajib was born in modern day Kyrgyzstan, which was also a Karakhanid territory. And then he moved towards the center at this time in Kashkar. Kashkar is perhaps the most famous city of East Turkestan, one of the most historic cities of the region. Uh, in a major center of Islamic learning and of saints. We'll talk more about it, inshallah, later. Uh, but he moves towards Kashgar, and he kind of, you know, enters into the court of the Karakhanid ruler, and he writes this work called Kutadgu Bilig. Kutadgu Bilig. So Kutadgu Bilig means in old Turkic. So like the language before the language before Uyghur, but it's still somewhat mutually intelligible. And actually all the words in this word are even intelligible in like Western Turkish of modern Turkey. Kutadgu uh, Bilik literally means like the knowledge or the wisdom which gives this sort of royal fortune. Uh, so in this story, in this text, he basically talks about what ideal rules should be like. It's a text directed towards the ruler. And in many ways, he's talking about what ideal rules should be like, but he doesn't just talk about how the ruler should behave with justice. He also talks about the ethical formation of the ruler. So in many ways, this is a mirror for princes text. So mirror for princes texts are texts that kind of try and morph the conduct of rulers. And we see them, especially in Persian literature. Many of the, actually the most famous Persian mirror for princes that people know and read to this day were actually written after Yusuf Hajib's work that was written, again, in a Turkic language. Uh, but it's not just a mirror for princes, it's also a mirror for the soul. So it doesn't just talk about this like ethical formation for the ruler, but it also talks about the sort of spiritual discourse more generally, about the idea of purification of the soul, a lot of Sufi norms, norms you know, relating towards like knowing the divine and purifying the self with being receiving the divine are embedded within the text. And what makes this text unique is not just you know, this combination uh, of, of ethical and spiritual paradigms, but also the framing of the text. So essentially the entire text is composed of 6,000 uh, lines that are couplets. Okay, so I think 6,000 or so couplets, uh, all in sustained meter. And there are four major characters in the text who basically speak to one another. And all the ideas that Yusuf Khas Hajib is trying to convey come through these characters. So these characters are the king who's named Rising Sun, who stands in for justice, uh, full Moon, who's a vizier, Highly Praised, who's the vizier's son, and Wide Awake, who's an ascetic. And each of them are not just fulfilling a sort of uh, social role, but also there's some sort of value that's implied by them. So there's multiple layers of symbolism going on within this text that is, again, incredibly, incredibly powerful. Uh, and just to give you a few samples of what the text says. Uh, so the text begins in a way that's actually very common for a lot of Muslim texts of this time period, where it talks about, you know, the God, talks about the prophet, is praising, and then it talks about speech in general. 
Uh, so there are several like, uh, and talks about, you know, the four caliphs, a lot of things are very common to these types of texts from this time period. So an excerpt from the beginning, uh, we can see over here, uh, unfortunately, for some reason, it's being covered for me uh, by the, uh, by my uh, Zoom box. Give me one second, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know how to move that. Um, give me one second, I'm so sorry. Uh, uh, somebody says it's actually visible for us. Okay, I, I removed that. There we go. I think it's gone now, right? Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, so it says the, it, I wasn't able to see it, unfortunately. So the merciful Lord sent his beloved messenger, the choicest and finest of men. He was a lamp to all creatures in the night of darkness. His light has spread so far that it even shines upon you, the reader. There's another passage from later on in the text where he's talking about, you know, what the purpose of the slave is and how the slave can please God. The slave being the ab, the servant of God. So the slave of God is the one who relies on his worship alone and cannot find the way to, and, and cannot find the way to God's pleasure by himself. If you desire what pleases God, then desire what pleases the Muslims. God has no need of your service to him. Therefore, per, therefore perform your proper servitude and seek to win a good name. Whoever has the name of slave, his job is to serve. A slave who does not serve has the name only metaphorically. Be constant in your service then, for this is true servitude. So serve your fellow man to serve God, uh, again, embedded within this text. So let's move on to a different figure uh, within this time period, a contemporary figure of Yusuf Hashajib, but offering in a different space. So Mahmoud Kashgari, who passed away at the very beginning of the 12th century, was, a, was from Kashgar, again, in East Turkestan. And eventually he made his way with the rise of the fortunes of the Oghuz Turks of the Seljuks to Baghdad to the court of the Caliph. Uh, and the Seljuks, this, you know, Oghuz Turkic, so a different Turkic branch of rulers, kind of dominated the political landscape, but the caliph was still a central figure during this time period. And so he presents this text called Diwan Lugat al-Turk to the caliph. And this text, really in like the history of Islamic, Islamic hate, Islamic civilizational texts in general, is almost entirely unique. So it is a compendium of the Turkic languages. So essentially it talks about, it gives a sort of lexicon of the different Turkic dialects that existed from the time period, a sort of modern aerial linguistics, if you will, but also putting in nuggets of history, of social circumstance, of poetry. A lot of uh, common proverbs that we hear today are actually embedded within this very same text. So in the beginning of the text, he starts talking about why he's writing it. And so he mentions in this text, the fortunes of the Turks, why it's important that people know them. Why, why is the Caliph even asking to know them? So he talks about a hadith that he once heard. Uh, and he mentions he's not sure if it's authentic or not, but the message of it still rings true. That the hadith says, learn the tongue of the Turks for their reign will be long. So the, the Turkic peoples, the Oghuz, the Karakhanids and others will rule for a long time. And then Mahmoud Kashkari says, if this hadith is sound, if this tradition of the prophet is sound and the burden of the proof is on those, you know, to those who doubt it, then learning it is a religious duty. And if it is not sound, still wisdom demands it. So he's advocating even the learning and understanding of this language. And then again, in another early passage in the text, he talks about uh, different Turkic varieties that you hear in different places uh, in Central Asia and in East Turkestan. So he talks about uh, Balasagun, which is in Kyrgyzstan, which is the capital of the Karakhanids. Uh, and he also talks about uh, Kashka over here. Uh, and he talks about how they're like, you know, different varieties of Turkic and Kashgar, one more Persianized, one less Persianized. But again, at this time period, in the middle of the 11th century, literally in the 1070s when this book is written, uh, we see, you know, these languages being predominant in these areas, alhamdulillah. And in his work, I mentioned he has a lot of historical nuggets. So something Mahmoud Kashgari does is he sort of takes the people of East Turkestan and Turks more broadly and puts them into the sort of lineage of Islamic history on a wider scale. What I mean is this idea of biblical lineages, right? The sort of idea of, you know, they say people are Semitic, right? So the son of Se uh, uh, Shem, which is one of the sons of, you know, there's a particular lineage that comes from this biblical narrative that was very influential among Muslims, among Christians, among Jews. Uh, so he takes the Turkic people and he fits them into this narrative as well. That he puts them into this sort of biblical lineage. You know, they're in Islamic history, like the prophetic history as well. So he talks here about, you know, the, the, Tur the Turks are from, uh, you know, th there's like 20 tribes or so. And he mentions that, you know, the, the, they all trace back to the lineage of Turk bin Yafith bin Nur, of Turk, son of Yafith, son of Noah. So he puts it again into the ark, 
he's putting the, the people into this sort of lineage. Elsewhere in his text, he not only you know, fits the sort of biblical lineage for his people, but he also puts Quranic stories in conjunction with the lives of the people of East Turkestan. So he talks at one point in his text, uh, and I believe this is a translation by uh, Robert Devereaux, if I'm correct, that the king, the, the Turkic king, uh, you know, goes to, you know, the eastern lands, and Vulkarnain, who's Alexander the Great in the modern Karnas. Vulkarnain is a figure who features in Surah Kahf, the 18th surah of the Quran, and he's also considered, you know, equated with Alexander the Great quite often. So, you know, there, there's a battle essentially between this Turkic king and Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great is defeated, but afterwards, you know, to make peace, he built cities of Oyvar. And he remained there for some time. So at this time period, the word Oyvar referred to a smaller group than it does today. It was um, of the you know, Turkic groups that became the modern Oyvar, it was a smaller subsection. But he made cities you know, in the north of East Turkestan at this time period, according to this legendary narrative that's contained within this text. Again, fitting Quranic history into the history of his people. Sometimes the imaginings of history you know, tell us more about what people want to be and how they act than you know, the nitty gritty of, oh, this happened, that happened, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, and something his text, the one of the Turk, and you'll see it's actually in my background as well, uh, if you can see the little video clip, uh, <laughs> is that he has a world map. But it's not a traditional world map. It's a world map that is centered on the Turkic lands. Uh, so the typical world map of this time period, both in uh, you know, Muslim lands and Christian lands everywhere, really, was circular. And for the Muslims, especially typically south, was in the top of the map, and north was in the bottom of the map, and Mecca and Medina was in the center. Because he wants to talk about the Turkic peoples in particular, he actually puts the Karakhan domain in the center. So Balasagun, this over here you can see like an English translation version of the same map, Balasagun is in the center of the map essentially. That's what's important right now. And we can see beside Balasagun, again, in this imagining of the world, Kashgar, Yarkhan, Khotan, places that are uh, you know, predominant parts of East Turkestan, they're all in this map. And something else that makes this map unique, and I've never really seen one quite like this, is that the top of the map is actually the east, it's Sharq, right? Uh, so that's very different from the traditional map that has south at the top of the map among Muslims, or even the traditional western map that has north at the top. So very unique over here. And we can see in the bottom of the map, uh, we can see over here the land of Hijaz, so that's Mecca and Medina, you know, India off to the side, you know, all these territories that we talk about, it's just a different angle of looking at them. So after, let's fast forward a little bit. So Mahmoud Qashqari passed away in the 11th century, excuse me, the beginning of the 12th century. We're gonna fast forward a couple hundred years to a different circumstance, a different kind of awareness of East Turkestan. I'm not talking to about a figure from there, but somebody who visited the land. So Saadi Shirazi, which many of you may recognize, uh, was perhaps the most famous uh, Persian poet, uh, besides Rumi, perhaps, of all time. He's considered at least one of the five most famous Persian poets of all time. Uh, and he wrote this text, he wrote two very famous texts, one called the Bustan, one called Gulistan in Persian, that were essentially uh, trying to formulate the spiritual and ethical kind of life of, of the reader. And they're texts that not just when he wrote it, he published this work, Gulistan, in 1258, actually the same years of the Mongols conquered Baghdad, he published this text. Uh, it wasn't just at that time that it was being read, but even to the present day, you will find this text being read and being lived. Uh, if you go back to education in the 19th century in South Asia, before the British really changed things, this text was probably the most uh, important text besides like the Quran as like a primer for young like students. Uh, so in this text, he tells lots of stories in the Gulistan. And one of the stories is about his visit to Kashgar. So he says that he goes to the congregational mosque in Kashgar, and there he meets a young grammarian. So this young grammarian, you know, he describes in like radiant terms, is teaching Arabic grammar to a group, he's discussing Arabic grammar with a group of other students. And Saadi comes in and he makes, uh, you know, he makes some jokes about Arabic. He tells him he's from Shiraz. And the grammarian doesn't recognize Saadi, but he knows that in Shiraz, there's a poet named Saadi who's very famous, whose poetry he's heard, so he asks Saadi, he said, oh, can you tell me some of the poetry of Saadi? Again, not being aware. And so according to Saadi's story, he tells him some Arabic poetry that's you know, kind of comical. Then the young man asks, can you tell me some of his poetry in Persian? Because Persian is even more understood than Arabic for, for us. And then Saadi tells him some poetry in Persian. 
And eventually, uh, you know, the young man finds out that this is actually the poet himself. And, you know, he embraces him and uh, Saadi eventually has to leave. But he says upon leaving, you know, his experience was such with this young man in Kashgar. If I do not die of grief on the day of farewell, do not count me as honest in my affection. So we can see from the story a few things, whether it was historic or not, whether Saadi actually visited uh, this place or not. And we can see in 16th century uh, artistic miniature depiction of the story that Arabic learning, Arabic grammar, understanding the Quran, understanding Islamic legal texts, uh, it has, been, has a long, long history in East Turkestan. This young man was teaching grammar, Arabic grammar, uh, in the same manner that was, it was being taught in other places. Furthermore, Persian, Persian poetry, Persian literature, cultural norms, were also, also had like deep roots within the land. Uh, a lot of scholars talk about this idea of the Persianate, of the, and other terms that are somewhat different, the idea of a Balkan, Balkans to Bengal, that this entire region had a sort of Persian vibe, that Islam was talked about in Persian quite often. There was literature infused with norms about the divine. Essentially, there's an entire space of imaginary, the same sorts of poetic tropes kind of existed with this language in this space that can be employed in different ways in different places, but in a way that also kind of honored this sort of shared unity amidst the diversity. Uh, so very much Kashgar was a part of this wider sphere. So. Uh, we can see, I mentioned that you know, Arabic sources were predominant. So I did a quick, just a quick search of a few Arabic sort of manuscript sources and sources that talk about the works of different author. Uh, one text, maybe some of you may know it, uh, Hidayat al-Arafin from the 19th century, uh, especially was a major source. And it just goes through in Hijri years, some of the major authors uh, who were publishing works that had wide circulation in Arabic that were about the traditional Islamic sciences generally. Uh, and we can see over here against in Hijri years. Uh, so I only searched for Kashgari authors. I know other cities may have put many authors, but to make it simple, I just searched for Kashgar. And immediately we can see, you know, in the fifth century Hijri. So in the 11th, 12th century, uh, there was an author of a book on Adhkar. You know, a century, two centuries later, there's a noted author on Sufi texts. Uh, this figure over here, Imam Abu Abdullah Sadid al Din Muhammad, Muhammad al Kashgari. Uh, you can see the name Muhammad was common everywhere in the Muslim world. East Turkestan was no exception. Wrote a Hanafi fiqh, many works, but his most famous work was a Hanafi fiqh work. So Hanafis are one of the four major Sunni schools of law. So he wrote a work on like, jurisprudence in this school of thought called Munya al-Musalli wa Ghani al-Mubtadi. And this work is so widespread that you actually see commentaries on this work as far away as Damascus. So there's a tradition uh, among like Muslim authors in the Arabic tradition, especially of writing commentaries on works. You explain different terms, you expand upon it. So this work was, you know, had, had many expansions and commentaries in a diverse variety of regions. We can, you know, fast forward, you know, within another century, another author on like general nasiha on advice, one talking about miracles of saints, Sufi texts, other the soul of usul, and then even into the modern day, uh, this last piece, if you can see it, uh, talks about a, this is 14th century Hijri. This was literally 100 years ago. Less than 100 years ago, we see, a little over 100 years ago, perhaps, no, excuse me, less than 100 years ago, we see a major muhaddith, a scholar of the hadith, uh, who had many students, according to the text I was reading about him. And this is just a small sampling. So very much involved with that wider understanding of Islamic religious learning. Uh, so in 1258, I mentioned the Mongols took Baghdad. But a few decades before that, Mongol conquerors had actually conquered East Turkestan as well. So the Karakhanids didn't survive very long into the 13th century. Uh, and during this time period, you know, for the next you know, couple of centuries, the Chagatai branch of the Mongols. So the Mongol Empire divided into four pieces. And the Chagatai Khans, the Chagatai Khanate, ruled East Turkestan. And then eventually afterwards, different you know, offshoots or groups that were related to them ended up having rule. And the original you know, Mongols were not Muslim, but in the 14th century, they converted to Islam. And the way these type of stories go is usually there's like a saint that comes and can, like, according to the hagiographies, again, the legends of saints, usually a saint comes, he converts the ruler and then like everyone converts. Now, historically, it probably didn't happen that way. It was probably a more gradual process. But this story, I, I really want to tell, uh, and I'll explain why in, in a moment. So Jalal al-Din or Jamal al-Din Qataki from the city of Qatar. Qatar is a lost city in the Taklimakan desert. So a city of East Turkestan that was lost to the sand. Uh, and there's actually some interesting stories about why it was lost in the different hagiographies and histories, uh, but we won't get into that now. So he has an encounter 
Mr. Jamaluddin uh, or Jalaluddin, has an encounter with Timur Tughluq Khan, who is the major, who's at this point, according to the Tariq al Rashid the version of the account, which is perhaps the most famous version of the account, uh, is a prince of the Mongols, and eventually he's going to become Khan himself. And Timur Tughluq Khan is kind of affronted by this you know, saintly figure, and he asks him, you know, almost in a way to insult him, but out of some curiosity, He's like, oh, you're Muslim, you have this faith, but I don't understand what this is. He says that, look, I have a dog, okay, this dog of mine. Uh, I wonder, is my dog better or are you better? Really, he's trying to insult Jalaluddin. Is my dog better or are you better? And Jalaluddin responds by saying that if I have faith, you know, and I practice my faith and I die upon my faith, then I am better than this dog. But if I don't have this, then this dog is better than me. So it's this, you know, and this really strikes Timur Tughul Khan and he makes promises to eventually convert. And, you know, according to Tariq al-Rashid account, he converts at the hands of the son of Jalaluddin when he actually becomes Khan himself. And then afterwards, the Chagatai Khans become Muslim and eventually they even spread the faith. Now, the reason I wanted to tell this story, despite in my, in perhaps not having, you know, great historicity, is because I actually grew up hearing this story. My father told me the story when I was a kid about the saint visiting the Mongol Khan and you know, tell, tell him about the dog and about faith. Uh, and my father did not know this wider history growing up. He was not from a place where he would have known this history, but this story made its way to him. So the stories about faith, about identity that are told in East Turkestan have such resonance that they find you know, lives far away. After looking up the history of this Tariq al-Rashid, the version of the story, I did a Google search and actually I found that one of the first results was a telling of the story in Indonesia, an Indonesian newspaper was telling the same story. Uh, so it has like a wide range. And this trope of like a dog and faith, it's an old trope, it goes beyond this particular incident. Uh, there are different texts that use this kind of idea in different ways, but it goes to show that the stories of East Turkestan had a wide resonance, and also they were participant in the themes and topoi, the sort of narrative elements of other parts of the sort of Islamic, wider Islamic imaginary. So, uh, I mentioned now that so the different, you know, the Mongols and Mongol successor states, you know, became Muslim. They participated in spreading Islam to new areas. Really, we see under them that like the land becomes overwhelmingly Muslim eventually. Uh, in the 15th century, Timur Lame, Timur the Lame, was a uh, sort of Turkic conqueror that conquered, you know, much of the known world and especially Central Asia. He conquered Anatolia, the wide swath of regions. And the reason I especially want to talk about him is because there were certain cultural formations that began to develop, especially under, his, under the, the rule of his successors. So he established a short-lived empire and his, you know, his children and grandchildren, they broke it up into different states. Uh, but in one particular state in the 15th century, late 15th century, we see a flourishing of Chagatai Turkic or Chagatai Turkish. So Chagatai Turkish is especially an academic term to refer to this because it, you know, is predominant in former Chagatai Mongol lands. But essentially it is a literary Turkic language that is the direct ancestor, the direct literary ancestor of modern Uyghurche. So the modern Uyghur language is directly descended from this language. And the authors that wrote in this language, in this wider cultural sphere, so not just writing in East Turkestan, but other parts of Central Asia, uh, even Babur, Babur, the conqueror of India, the first Mughal emperor, wrote his own biography, his own memoirs in this language of Chagatai Turkic. So it was a very widespread language, really like along with Persian, it was a major literary language of this you know, wider region. Uh, so Mir Ali Shirinavai, who's the figure uh, pictured over here, is perhaps the most famous writer in Chagatai Turkic. He's in many ways considered the father of the sort of literary standard of the language. So he was a Timurid uh, minister in the government in Harat, in modern day Afghanistan. And when he lived at the end of the 15th century, turn of the 16th century, it was perhaps one of the greatest cultural and intellectual flourishings in human history. So not only was he an author of incredible works of poetry and prose, you know, a very sophisticated author in both Persian and Chagatai Turkic, but he was friends very close friends, and his spiritual mentor was actually Jami. Jami was one of the other five greatest Persian poets. Uh, incredible, incredible poet whose work spread everywhere. So he was close friends with him. In fact, Jami brought Mir Ali Shirinavai into the Naqshbandi, this Sufi order, the Naqshbandi Sufi order. Uh, he also lived and he actually helped to sponsor Bahzad. Bahzad was a famous miniature artist, an illustrator of the time period. He sponsored him. Uh, he lived at the same time as Hussein Kashafi, who he actually knew, 
Hussein Kashafi wrote perhaps the most famous narrative of the death of Hussein radiallahu an, a narrative that he actually, I believe, and others actually translated into Chagatai Turkic, but had incredible afterlives you know, across this wider region. So he writes, Mir al a uh, book where he compares Turkic with Persian. And he argues for the superiority of Turkic. He writes in this work, then I reached the age of comprehension and God, whose praise I recite and who will be extolled, instilled in me sensitivity and, att and attentiveness and a desire for the unique. I realized the necessity of giving thought to Turkish words. The world which came into view is more sublime than 18,000 worlds, and its adorned sky, which I came to know, was higher than nine skies. There I found a treasury of superiority and excellence in which the pearls were more lustrous than the stars. I entered the rose garden. Its roses were more splendid than the stars of heaven. Its hollowed ground was untouched by hand or foot, and its myriad wonders were safe from the touch of other hands. So he compares this language, this ancestor of Oyvache, of the language of East Turkestan, to a treasury of star-like pearls. It's incredibly beautiful. He talks about different linguistic features which actually do feature in the language today, uh, that have been preserved in the language today. They're just, you know, absolutely incredible, and he shows the beauty of them. So, you know, there's this unique identity, this local nuance. There is a language, this own, you know, language in its own self. But also this language relates itself back to other languages of the Muslim world, to other foundational language. You know, pearls form when there is like some kind of creature that kind of irritates a clam, uh, excuse me, an oyster, and then this kind of bubble sorts of forms in the oyster and then it's filled up in a pearl kind of form. So you need this sort of interaction. It does, a pearl doesn't just form on its own. And so we see these are some words in modern Uyghurche that have Arabic and Persian roots. So, uh, perzent, right? Uh, I'm saying this in the Persian pronunciation. It's farzand in Persian. We can see there's an F to P shift in the pronunciation. It means child. Or kitab, which means book. Or mu'allem, which means teacher from Arabic. Bag, which means garden. Gul, like the word for gulistan, that word of, uh, that Saadi used, the, fl the flower garden. It means flower in uh, you know, in Oyvoche. Marjan, which is the word actually for a pearl or coral or even a pearl necklace uh, in, in the Persian and the Oyvoche usage, you know, comes from Arabic through Persian. So they're all interconnected. It's this wonderful mixing uh, that produces such great beauty. So to move a little bit further in time period and to focus on East Turkestan again in particular, I want to talk about a little bit about the life of another saint whose name was Muhammad Sharif. So Muhammad Sharif lived during the time of Abdul Rashid Khan who was a, a ruler in much of the Turin Basin, uh, a descendant, I think, of the Mongols or some other Turkic rulers. Uh, and Muhammad Sharif came from, you know, perhaps Uzbekistan, from Bukhara, to Kashgar. Kashgar, again, which I said was one of the cultural uh, centers of East Turkestan. And after coming to Kashgar, he made contact with the local ruler. And he actually, you know, from sort of dream visions that he was having, he came to the tomb of Satuk Bugra Khan, the figure I mentioned at the beginning of our narrative, uh, the sort of Islamic foundational figure. He actually visits his tomb right outside of Kashgar, and he kind of maintains the tomb, and he has visions of the saint, and he relates back to him. And then eventually he goes on Hajj. He takes a route towards Hajj uh, to visit Mecca and Medina, visit the Prophet Islam's grave, and then return. And this particular version of, there's several editions of the story. I believe the one I read was a 17th century translation, a translation of a 17th century text. It was Jeff Eden again did the translation. So in the story, he travels from Kashgar through India, actually. He goes through modern day Surat, Surat in Gujarat. Uh, and then he travels from Surat by sea to uh, Mecca and Medina. And during this time period, in the middle of the 16th century, Surat was actually becoming a major cosmopolitan center where traders and peoples of all different places from all different lands were gathering in this one center. Uh, and especially, I'll talk about Surat because I actually have relatives who live there today. So it's funny that he passed through the city on his route. Uh, but again, a major cosmopolitan center. So we can see from the story immediately, we haven't even finished his story yet, but the Muslims of East Turkestan, by way of the Hajj, by way of trade for a city like Surat, were connected, not just intellectually, but physically with the rest of the sort of wider, you know, Muslim uh, domains, that they were involved in the movements and the trade and the discourses of these travels. Uh, so he returns after his visit to the, you know, Central Holy Lands to uh, Ashgar, and then he kind of embarks on a career of founding holy sites, where he has different visions and dreams, and he rediscovers the tombs of different Muslim saints that populated the land. 
And with the help of Abdul Rashid Khan, he kind of raises up, you know, you know different masajid, different mosques, uh, different, uh, you know, tombs, according again to this hagiography of him. And what we can see in this story is that the life of Muhammad Sharif was very much similar to other hagiographies, other saintly narratives. And this idea of dream visions is also a sort of wider discourse. But there are certain particularities of it, the way he sees the characters, that are also very local and very unique. So again, there's this discourse between the universal and the local. We see take place once again, even in this sort of narrative. But in addition, we see that he finds in his own life, he sees the importance of implotment. That Muslim graves, the Muslims who are buried, the saints that came before, the people buried in the soil, make the land Muslim. Like seeds, they are the, you know, the source of the forests that grow, the forests of Islam that grow in the land. They are sources of barakah, of blessing. We can imagine a land that has Muslims buried there, a land that has the stones themselves have been soaked by the adhan for generation, is a, a land where Islam doesn't, isn't shed off easily. Islam is in the soil in Muhammad Sharif's very story. So, you know, from the 16th century onwards, and I'm covering, I guess, a lot of ground over here. Uh, again, it wasn't just this wide, this discourse of saints in particular, or that, which again, these saintly stories, like Muhammad Sharif's story, when they were written down, they were often told. They were read and they were told orally. There was visitations of the shrines of these figures that had these stories told about them. And this was a major way that people learned their own history. Uh, for centur centuries with different variations. Riyan Thumb has an excellent book on this that's way more nuanced than I can capture in this short time. But again, it wasn't just these particular sites or this like elite literature, or what have you, that represented what Islam was in the land. It was also that you know, daily discourses, even the music was infused with Islamic norms. So this is a you know, drawing by a friend of mine, uh, an artistic depiction of Amman Nisa Khan. So Amman Nisa Khan is again, another legendary figure uh, she's talked about first in the middle of the 19th century uh, in uh, history of musicians. Uh, but her life took place in the 16th century. In fact, uh, according to the narrative, she was actually the wife of Abdul Rashid Khan, the ruler I mentioned earlier who helped sponsor Muhammad Sharif. So she helps to preserve what are called the 12 Muqams. So it's a sort of wide, you know, musical cycle that's still told and practiced and alive today. And within this, this like, cycle of music, different Sufi tropes and norms are preserved. Uh, so it's very much this, again, local music fused and imbibed with all these different varieties. Uh, we can see over here depictions of different uh, instruments of East Turkestan. So to fast forward a little bit more, uh, I mentioned earlier about the Naqshbandis, if anyone remembers. I know I'm mentioning a lot of figures and places, so totally okay if uh, I'm moving a bit too fast, my apologies. But I mentioned Naqshbandis were a Sufi order. That uh, the Sufi order, like many Sufi orders, connected itself, right? It, it was a sort of set of spiritual practices or a spiritual community that connected itself in a, you know, a, a spiritual chain back to the Prophet that these teachings according to the claim of the Sufi order were taught by the prophet to Abu Bakr, his companion, and eventually they were taught to uh, uh, Jafar al-Sadiq, who is a descendant of both Ali radiallahu an, the cousin of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and of Abu Bakr, who was a de descendant of the prophet sallallahu himself, to several other figures, right? And there are different branches that arrive, uh, that arise from the Sufi order. So this Sufi order, among, along with several other Sufi orders, become very predominant in East Turkestan. A lot of major figures, elites, and perhaps locals and non-elites as well, are involved in these sorts of discourses. So uh, I mentioned earlier about Mir Ali Shirnavai. So Mir Ali Shirnavai was inducted into the Naqshbandi order by Jami, the famous Persian poet. Jami in turn was inducted into the order by a fellow by the name of Saad al-Qashgari. So of someone by the name of Saad who seemed to have come from Qashgar. Uh, a major figure of the 15th century, not just in East Turkestan, but all throughout Central Asia, even into Anatolia, was Ahmed Yasavi. Ahmed Yasavi was another uh, Naqshbandi writer. And now finally to talk about this uh, image I have over here. So this image is a particular uh, simultaneously genealogical and spiritual lineage of the Apak or Afak Khojas. So the Apak or Afak Khojas were a group descend, so the first, the, the main figure, was Apak Khoja, who became a ruler of Kashgar in the late 17th century. Uh, and him and his entire line were descended, you know, as we can see, you know, these different circles going back up to Makhdum al-Adam, 
It was Ahmed Kashani. Ahmed Kashani was a major Naqshbandi figure of the 15th century. So his descendants in the 17th century become these sorts of simul these kind of worldly rulers with the sort of spiritual lineage, this kind of simultaneity, right? Again, right, I'm saying that Sufism is dominant. I mean, like literally dominant in the land. Uh, but of course, you know, in the midst of uh, you know uh, Jungarian and then you know Qing domination, the Apa Khojas you know often did not have power afterwards. But even when they were not you know temporally in power, they were kind of the symbols quite often of revolt, of rebellion against Qing domination, uh, the, the Qianglong Empire's domination. So we see this quite often that you know different revolts uh, arise around these Apa Khoja figures, these sort of Sufi leader figures. Uh, and even Yaqub Beir, who e erected a state in the late 19th century, was in some way, some way or the other, you know, in a complex manner, connected with and kind of dealt with these figures. So again, to, to move into the 19th century, again, moving quite quickly because it's a huge history and we're just touching the surface, really just a glimpse of the wider whole. Uh, I want to give us sort of, again, another material or perhaps literary uh, image or snapshot of what Islam was like. So this is the 19th century, early 20th century, you know, just a little over 100 years ago, that a figure by the name of Gunnar Jaring, Gunnar Jaring was a Swedish diplomat, came to East Turkestan and he collected a lot of manuscripts. In total, he collected over 500 manuscripts, manuscripts being handwritten texts. And he brings these texts back to Sweden and uh, Alhamdulillah, they're accessible as for research. And in fact, over 200 of them have been digitized. So you can see them today. Uh, and they give you, again, a kind of snapshot, not just of what he was interested in, but what types of materials, what sort of literary texts were read or being recited in the land at, you know, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And so we see, you know, a history of Yaqub Beir, uh, this is a small sampling. The poetry of Mir Ali Shirnavai, the figure I mentioned earlier, his works had resonance in these lands. The poetry of Ahmed Yasabi, the Naqshbandi figure I mentioned earlier. Works on the Miraj, the ascension of the Prophet. Stories of the Prophet works, especially Raghabuzi. So Raghabuzi wrote in Khwarizmian Turkic, which is the same language essentially that Yusuf Khas wrote in, a sort of ancestor of Chagatai. So he wrote a story of Stories of the Prophet collection that was translated into Chagatai that was very much alive within East Turkestan. And you can imagine these types of stories the prophets were quite often recited. Different folkloric texts about, uh, you know, Mola Nasruddin or Nasruddin Afendi or Nasruddin Hoja, this sort of comical figure who gives ethical kind of knowledge, whose kind of his folkloric stories are spread all the way from East Turkestan to Turkey. They even morphed into a different figure in Egypt, a very widespread. We see these type of texts telling his stories. There are also Futua manuals of various professions. So Futua is it's often translated as Sufi chivalry. It's sort of like uh, quite often, but not always a guild oriented kind of development of spirituality uh, it, across Central Asia into Anatolia. Uh, you know, one of the major figures was a late Abbasid Caliph and like the development of it has many manifestations, but we see within his collection several manuals for different professions. So there's a text about blacksmiths, uh, a text about, I think, people that deal with the weather or something, several different texts. And each one of these texts kind of give like a weird, they tell things that the person should recite, you know, words praising God. They also tell stories about the prophets that relate towards this profession. Oh, you're a blacksmith? Well, David, Dawood, uh, the father of Solomon was involved in this profession. So we can imagine these texts were probably used in the different guilds and these centers, kind of giving the sort of uh, vernacular spirituality. Uh, again, the, all these texts I'm mentioning over here are written in Chagatai, Turkic, uh, which again, it's continuous into modern Uyghur. There were even, and I, I love this, there were even commentaries of Saadi's Gulistan in Chagatai. So the Gulistan I mentioned where Saadi the poet talks about visiting East Turkestan, that was actually uh, commented on in Chagatai Turkic, in the very land that he said he visited. Uh, we also see translations from Persian and Arabic into uh, Chagatai Turkic and, you know, into you know, what is now like Uyghur. Uh, and these translations weren't necessarily word for word translations. They were also interpretive. They take the same narrative and deploy it in different ways. They add on to it. So Hussein Kashif, Va Va uh, Hussein Vais Kashifi's work on the, you know, the deaths of the Hussein radiallahu anh and his companions. Um, Jami, who I mentioned earlier, who was involved in Miranishir Navai, his famous telling of the story of Yusuf and Zulaikha. Works of Al-Ghazali, Al-Ghazali, the famous like synthesizer of the 12th century, were translated into Uyghurche. Khalilah with Dimna, the sort of Indic and then Persianate and then, you know, Arabic uh, collection of, and then again, Persian, it moves all around of fables, animal fables that talk about just rule and ethical behavior. Uh, Firdosi, who wrote this narrative of the Persian, like, epic, sort of 
poetic history. It's translated. Uh, the story of Amir Hamza, so it's this epics that are based upon the life of the Prophet Sallallahu uncle, but going crazy different directions that have nothing to do with his actual life, uh, which were really predominant in India especially, we see them translated uh, into Uyghurche. And we also, and of course, these are my favorite type of texts personally, we also have different hagiographies, uh, stories of different saints. And these collections of saints, some of them are international, like, you know, trans-regionally renowned figures. Abdul Qadir Jilani, Ibrahim bin Adham, uh, these are figures that you know are uh, honored as far away as Morocco and and, and Surabia, you know, like from from Morocco to Indonesia. These figures are honored, but also several local figures. Khoja Abu Nasr Samani, the guy who brought Satuk Burhan into Islam. Jaladin Kataki, who I mentioned earlier. Satuk Burhan, the Apa Khoja, uh, other descendants of Makhdumi Azma, other Apa Khojas, and in fact even Yut Bibi Padisha. Inshallah, I'm trying to to translate this text. We'll see how it goes. Uh, it's, a it's a text about a female saint of Yarkand. Uh, so it wasn't just men. Oftentimes history, we often talk about the male figures. I mean, the entire society is participant in these sort of things in various degrees and various ways. And these are little excerpts of the different texts. Um, and so I just want to, you know, move from there. I talked a bit about, uh, you know, this literary tradition in the late 19th century, early 20th century. We can imagine that Sufi sites are being visited, that these stories are being told, they're recited. You don't have to be literate to hear this sort of information. Uh, and in the 20th century, this doesn't stop. In the 20th century, despite Chinese oppression uh, of the time period, still Muslims were writing, Muslims were participant in like different reform movements that were common across the Muslim world. Uh, the different scholars arose. Uh, a figure who I think is really emblematic of what happened in East Turkestan is Muhammad Saleh Hajim. So Muhammad Saleh Hajim passed away two years ago in 2018. So Muhammad Saleh Hajim wrote an Uyghurche translation of the Quran in a commentary, essentially. Uh, so he's a great scholar and it's a beautiful translation. So it says, and forgive my pronunciation, this is the same ayah, the same verse of the Quran we started the presentation with about the diversity of tongues. So he writes, Allah nang asman lerni, zemin yarat khan laki, til lering lerning, rengi lering lerning, hal muhal bulushi, Allah, uh, like this beautiful translation of the same ayah we talked about before. The entire translation is like that. Uh, so he was taken into Chinese custody uh, and he died in Chinese police custody. They said, oh, he passed away. Allah knows what he underwent, but he passed away in this custody. And today his daughter, I believe, is in a camp. Uh, his daughter is also in this sort of custody. So very much Islam was practiced, Islam was rich despite oppression. But today, especially, there's increasing turmoil and oppression and attacks against religious practice. Uh, and to give you know one more example before you know I get to my conclusion. Uh, so I mentioned Muhammad Sharif, the great saint of the 16th century, who worked with Abdul Rashid Khan, the local ruler. So uh, he this Karbalak Grand Mosque uh, was a mosque, this major you know. Friday prayer mosque in Karabalak, that Muhammad Sharif, according to legend, was the one who said it should be founded. He told the ruler, he said, I want you to build a mosque here. Uh, and it was destroyed in 2018. It was demolished in 2018. After surviving and even being redeveloped and expanded over hundreds and hundreds of years of existence, it was destroyed in 2018. Uh, and this is not the only site. There are dozens of sites of shrines of different saints, of mosques, places that have been visited for centuries, that have been the centers of celebration and learning and telling these sorts of historical stories have been demolished. Uh, God of mercy, but I mean, this is, uh, but again, as in the case of Muhammad Sharif, where he sort of rediscovered lost saints, so too can these sites grow again and be rediscovered. So to sort of recap, uh, a bit of what I've been saying. Uh, again, it's a lot of information I know, and it's a very brief take on a, a wide and rich history. Islam in East Turkestan was simultaneously self-consciously Islamic. It was part of the wider ummah while simultaneously being attuned to local identity with having that local nuance. And there wasn't a contradiction. They didn't perceive a contradiction between that. Today, academics might come in, today, Orientalists might come in, whoever might come in and find contradictions. Oh, this is syncretism, this is this, this is that. No, in reality, this was something that was perfectly normal and natural. It was a part of all of these holes completely. It wasn't the mixing of two peers. It was itself something, uh, you know, radiant by itself. Uh, East Turkestan was a part of the Persian literary sphere, as we saw. And Euler's and, you know, different peoples of East Turkestan are direct inheritors of Chagatai one of the great languages of Islamic civilization. East Turkestan was firmly connected with the rest of Islam then in birth, both of networks of people and objects, being trades and texts, uh, materials, and all these different sorts of ways. 
the Islamic sciences, you know, the Sawuf, et cetera, were all also alive and well, along with the different literary narrative and romances, all of them, they were all alive in East Turkestan. And the land was constantly made sacred and its sacredness was reenacted through the burial and lived remembrance of saints, of different figures who were exemplars in the path of, of the divine. And so the four question and answers, oh no, uh, that's blocked out. Let me see if I can uh, get a better view now. Uh, it's weird that it's, uh, I don't know if you all can see it. I can't see it, unfortunately. Uh, so there's this, it, so in the text of uh, Mahmoud Sharif, uh, the saint I mentioned earlier, so in the hagiography about him, there's a dua, a sort of supplication to God that he makes, that it's attributed to him. And so I just wanted to very quickly, I guess, read through at least a portion. I think, unfortunately, the image isn't showing up over here, uh, at least on my screen, a portion of this prayer that he made, uh, this dua that he allegedly made. And it's in Chagatai Turkic. Uh, and those who know Oyoche, you, you'll probably understand quite a lot of it. Those who know Persian will probably understand quite a lot of it. It says, Maksud sen sen e khuda, ma'bud sen sen e khuda, masjud sen sen e khuda, sen sen manga faryadras. That's the refrain that comes over and over again. Sen sen manga faryadras. Sen sen ilahim khuda, sen sen qawahim e khuda, sen sen penahim e khuda, sen sen manga faryadras. Asi kulung durmen fakir, jafi kulung durmen hakir, nafs ilide buldum asir, sen sen manga faryadras. A razik a hey kadim, afu elege sen e karim, hajit rakir e rahim, sen sen manga faryadras. Like over and over it goes through. And uh, Jeff uh, Eden, uh, who you know translated this text, gives a translation as well of this prayer uh, at the very end. So he says, you are the aim, you, O Lord. You are the deity, you, O Lord. You are the adorned one, you, O Lord. You are my defender, Faryadras. You, you are my Lord, O God. You, you are my witness, O Lord. You, you are my shelter, O Lord. You, you are my defender. I am your disobedient slave. I am your barefoot slave. I am tiny. I am a prisoner in the hands of the lower self. You, you are my defender. O oh, ancient living provider, forgive me, O oh, generous one. Provide what is needed, compassionate one. You, you are my defender. Endless sins I have committed. With every breath I cry, ah, I cry, last. On judgment day, my book is black. You, you are my defender. I am weeping, O oh, Lord. I am most alive, O oh, Lord. I am in confusion, O oh, Lord. You, you are my defender. I discovered your scent at the hour of dawn. I cry aloud in your lane. A vagabond, I've walked your path. You, you are my defender. I am mad and restless. I am weeping in misery. I cry bitterly, bitterly in separation from you. You, you are my defender. So, you know, a prayer hundreds of years old in this vernacular language that I think has a powerful resonance for all of us even today. All I personally can say, you know, is, I mean, may, may God accept. Uh, and so with that, uh, love to open the floor uh, for any announcements that have to be made uh, by the organizers, but also comments and questions. I'm also a student of this. I consider myself a complete amateur. I'm here to learn from you and I hope you've benefited something. And I ask your forgiveness and God's forgiveness for any mistakes or, you know, <laughs> obliterations of nuance, you know, fumbles that I have made. Thank you. Jazakallah khair, Amr Rahman. That was a really great presentation. I think a lot of people have been watching on social media as well and commenting how um, first impressed uh, they were. And they someone commented that, uh, you know, this this kid's not, a, I mean, he, he could probably be Uyghur because of how much history he's been uh, explaining to the, to the audience. And uh, um, I myself learned a lot. So thank you again. Um, uh, for uh, anyone with questions or comments, please go ahead and um, use the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, it's there for your purpose. So um, does anyone have anything to add, any comments or something that you guys would like to share? So I see something about uh, access to the PowerPoints. Uh, yeah, I can uh, happily, uh, you know, either download it or give a link to the PowerPoint. Uh, I, I'll give it to uh, the organizers and they can hopefully send it out to people. And I can also, I, I didn't include a bibliography, but I'm happy to maybe within a week or so put a bibliography, a bibliography together for the sources that I used and, and send them out as well. Okay, well, I mean, nobody's asking questions, I'm surprised, because <laughs> there's a lot that was covered. Um, Hina, do you have anything to add? Hina is also one of our um, panelists today, or not panelists, today. she's part of one of the co-sponsors from Muslim Matters, also the Director for Justice for All. Assalamu alaikum. 
Jazakallah khair. Uh, uh, it, this was wonderful. I, I just the connection. I, you know, when I sometimes when we speak about this in just the framework of oppression and genocide, and uh, you forget all the rich history and the uh, the ties of the ummah and uh, just the words that you were saying, and I could I can hear I could hear those words in the the poetry that has been recited in my own home, and subhanallah, like the traditions and uh, it, that was. And yes, we know it, but just to see it in the way you presented it, Jazakallah khair. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, current, uh, uh, if you could do a, a, a little bit of what um, Islam was like currently. Uh, were there madrasas teach, um, uh, teaching Islam uh, right before um, like 2017? What was, um, how was Islam spread at that point? If you could. Um, and I think you're cutting off just slightly. I don't know if it's just me. Do you mind repeating the last part of your question? Um, yes, my question was, what was the uh, current status of Islam in um, East Turkestan? Just right around 2017, uh, was it taught in madrasas? I would really like um, to hear a little bit more about current status as well. So I think, uh, you know, someone who's been resident uh, in East Turkestan, who I think many of the audience have, could probably answer this a lot better than I could. But just to give a sort of maybe related answer, not exactly answering what you're talking about, uh, you know, Euler students, you know, until very recently, were also going abroad to study Islam. So there were a lot of Euler students in Al-Azhar, Al-Azhar being one of the major centers for Islamic learning in the world in Cairo and Egypt. Uh, and then again, another sort of emblematic of what's happening in general, uh, the Chinese government requested their extradition from the Egyptian government. Uh, and like all Muslim governments in great cowardice, uh, they actually sent them back. So to this time period, there are people, you know, regularly, uh, you know, learning the deen, traveling to learn the deen in different ways. Uh, and then these, these modes of knowledge transmission were disrupted. Uh, we can imagine you know, into the current period, you know, decades or two decades ago, it wasn't as bad. Probably in the more scenicized areas like Urumqi, for example, there was a little bit less of this transmission in the public sphere, but in other areas, it was even a bit more public. Uh, but again, it's just, there's even, even greater and greater degrees of removal and oppression. Uh, but I think someone who's been there again can talk a lot more fluently about it. I'd also like to add that essentially right now, um, is practicing Islam is essentially prohibited in all aspects. Um, um, except for the, when it comes to the five pillars, except, you know, declaring the Shahada, uh, practicing all other pillars are essentially criminalized and can land someone into a camp or prison. It's, it's come to the point where even saying Assalamu Alaikum is considered a crime and can also land someone into a camp or prison. And a lot of Uyghurs, and I'm sure there are some attendees or listeners who can attest to this, but uh, if we ever manage to get in contact with some of our relatives or loved ones, on WeChat, uh, you would rarely hear them greet each other. We wouldn't greet each other with the Assalamu Alaikum. Um, and so I think that that itself is a, is a um, it kind of sheds light on how much Islam is cracked down upon and how the smallest acts that we deem as kind of a normal act is, is um, basically putting into camp worthy for the Chinese government. Uh, in addition to that, I mean, we've, me, me, you may have also heard about uh, you know, Muslim names being banned, um, things like uh, names like Muhammad, Fatima, the classic Islamic Muslim name that you hear of um, are also prohibited. And if somebody has these names already, uh, they are highly encouraged to change these names to uh, Han Chinese names as well. So again, this for those who, who did not know this, this is just an extra fact that you guys can keep in mind when thinking about the scale of oppression uh, and uh, religious restriction happening. Uh, so somebody else also commented uh, and asked, um, what can we as Muslims do to show our Uyghur brothers and sisters that we are with them even though we are far? So I think Aiden, you should take that first and then I'll give some supplementary answer, but I'd like to hear your answer more. Okay, well, I'm a moderator, so I'm like trying to limit my answering questions, but I, it's hard to, I guess, hold back. And I, and I, I also realized that with this, um, uh, attendees can't really like say the question so they have to type it out but I'll try my best I mean obviously 
Uh, I mean, dua is the, the number one if you're a Muslim praying for us or if you're of any other uh, faith as well as praying for uh, our people, I think is the number one. If you're a religious leader in your community, really prioritizing this issue and making it something that is talked about, I think is number one, because I feel like even for the longest time, uh, being an Uyghur person, living in America, I've witnessed uh, even during khutbahs, for example, during Jumma prayer, uh, you know, a lot of khutib would forget to make dua when they're making the dua for oppressed populations at the end. That's like a very small example, you know, um, with regards to how forgotten we have felt uh, for the longest time. Alhamdulillah, I think that has been better. I think a lot of people have, a lot of people are stepping up on this and really making the effort to learn more and uh, prioritize this cause. So, you know, may Allah reward all those who have uh, been doing so. Um, but uh, in general, it's just doing your part uh, individually in, in your community. Uh, I don't know uh, who asked this or where you're from, but you know, if you look, if you're from the States, there are a whole bunch of action items that you can be doing to uh, contact Congress uh, and, and the Senate to pass the Oil Force Labor Act, um, or just in general, just getting involved in your um, in, in trying to advocate for the cause with your government and just honestly making sure that this conversation and what you've learned today or what you've learned in general about what is happening is a conversation that is constantly happening and that we're constantly proactive and trying to figure out what to do. Uh, so I think that's a short answer to your question. Um, and I think we'll move on to the next one, inshallah. Okay. Um, oh, also, um, oh yeah, obviously, yeah, okay. So that, that has been, uh, I guess I address that in the shortest way possible since we are uh, getting close to running out of time. So um, there are a lot more questions that people have asked. I'll answer maybe a bunch at once, perhaps. So in terms of Islamic languages spoken in East Turkestan, so today Persian and Arabic aren't really spoken as much. I mean, a lot of like the religiously learned would know Arabic though. Uh, and we actually see like novels talking about, you know, a, a student or traveler going to Hajj who actually already knows some Arabic. Uh, but if we're going back, you know, 100, 150 years ago, then, you know, Oyghur or Chagatai at that time period, Persian and Arabic were the common literary languages. Arab, most Islamic law texts were be, would be written in Arabic. Uh, in other places, I'm not as much familiar in the circumstance, we do see like certain like law primers written in Persian or another kind of like vernacular. Uh, so that happens occasionally, but more so we see like uh, literary texts, uh, poetry written in Oyghur and uh, in Chagatai and in Persian. Uh, and we see like hagiographies hey, especially would be written in Oyghur. A lot of texts that were in Persian would be moving in there. Um, a text like uh, kind of general spirituality texts, uh, texts like a lot of uh, Al-Ghazali's works, which were kind of for like everyone, but talked about a wide range of religious practice would also be texts we'd see in translation, for example. Um, and then in terms of uh, the role of saints, shrines, and the preservation of local culture and language more recently, uh, so very much like, you know, shrines were, were and until the present day, until like literally until their destruction, uh, were very much centers of, uh, you know, remembrance of these sorts of histories, of the stories of these saints, these stories were told. In many ways, these stories of saints are stories that are embodied. That people learn religious values and morals and ways of being from these stories. They're not things on paper that you just pick up. They're things that you kind of live, you enact. Uh, and these sorts of festivals and visitations were very much involved with this. But something you see, especially in the late 20th century, is the rise of like a culture of novels. So a lot of the history was preserved within novels uh, in East Turkestan. Like novels quite often uh, would tell a lot of these stories in a more colloquial format. Uh, and so even the Satuk Bukhra Khan, who I mentioned, for example, uh, a lot of people might not know that hagiography, even though it was a very like predominant hagiography, they might know the similar story through a popular novel uh, from like the mid to late 20th century. Uh, and inshallah, a lot of, you can access a lot of novels today uh, online. There are a lot of uh, YouTube readings of novels. There are a lot of uh, websites. Unfortunately, not many things have been translated. Uh, some hagiographies hey, have been translated into English and a couple of like, short stories, etc. but there aren't that many that have been translated, unfortunately. Um, okay, uh, then um, CCP, C. Islam is studying it. How do I the difference? I, I think it, so- uh, the, Can between, you also address what the question is before answering? Okay, so it says it is clear that CCP, C. Islam and studying it as clear forms of terrorism, yet China has very close relations to Muslim countries like Pakistan. How do we reconcile this? Uh, so I attended a talk recently by Ryan Thumb, who I think is much more of an expert on this subject than I am, where he talks about the difference between the Hui and the Uyghurs. Uh, 
right? And why is it the Hui? The Hui are like ethnically Chinese Muslims because their Islam is seen, and even now they're actually facing some oppression, right? But because historically their Islam, Islam was seen as more like sinicized and the Uyghur's Islam was seen more different, more foreign to Chinese values or modes of expression, what have you, uh, they were not oppressed as much as the Uyghurs themselves were oppressed. Uh, in terms of, again, China has close relations with Muslim countries like Pakistan for economic reasons, uh, to build these sorts of different sorts of pipelines. Uh, there's a pipeline that was being built through Pakistan, a port that was being built, built in Gawadar by the Chinese government. These are economic decisions. And for the same reasons that they're building things there, Muslim countries themselves have uh, unfortunately not been at the forefront of activism, had kind of denied, you know, really completely and utterly denied what's happening uh, because, you know, they, they want, like, you know, the dollar is a greater deity to a lot of these governments than, than God, uh, if we're putting it in an Islamic mode of thinking, uh, unfortunately. Um, so the next question was, before Islam, what did Uyghurs believe? Uh, so this is an interesting question because really this identity I'm talking about, this idea of Uyghur that we're talking about is something that was forged through the crucible of Islam. It was an entity very much formed of Islam. There were Turkic tribes that were starting to migrate to the region, everything before Islam. Uh, but like this identity in particular was very much forged through Islam. Now, if you go back over a thousand years ago, there were Manichaeans, there were uh, several like, uh, you know, Aryan peoples in East Turkestan, there were Buddhists, there were shamanistic beliefs, all these things did exist. Uh, but you know, yeah, various forms, I think one of the comments is saying practice all forms of religion, a lot of these forms of religion were very much practiced. Uh, and then, you know, in the 10th century, Islam begins to rise and, you know, for the next several hundred years, it really uh, increases in predominance. The, the interesting thing about this question, like there was, you know, different beliefs before Islam, there was literature, the old Uyghur empire that the people today take the name from, uh, eventually became a Buddhist empire and there are like amazing drawings that are preserved in caves from this empire, everything. The issue is that the, unfortunately, sometimes the, the Chinese government wants to talk about this pre-Islamic history and deny the Islamic history. You know, you jump back a thou over a thousand years ago, oh, that's what people really are. This Islam thing, they, they, these people aren't really Turks. They're not really this, they're not really that. They want to deny this history, right? So I think it's important also, like, these are all, like, again, different legacies, of course, absolutely. But the Islamic history, unfortunately, gets very much de-emphasized, or when it is emphasized by the Chinese government and others, it's emphasized in a way that, oh, it's radical, it's terrorism, it's this attack, blah, 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 all of that. But as we see, it's actually something rich and beautiful. Um, uh, for the, the next one. Uh, how to respond to people that still deny the genocide? Uh, again, I think I think it takes a little bit more. But uh, the thing is, people will always, unfortunately, uh, blindness is willful, right? A, a lot of times, people sometimes people are just ignorant. They actually don't know them, and they know they'll be awakened to something. But oftentimes, people are just because of their particular station, their social position, they don't want to see what's happening. Uh, so this it's the same way that it was happening in Palestine. Uh, we all know. Everyone's known for decades, and it's very much like in the public conscience, but people still deny it. People still kind of neglect this narrative because of their own social political positions, uh, because people, again, this, we live in a post-truth era where there are many truths and people refuse. Uh, so I think, you know, how, how to respond to them, though, I think being open and honest, sharing these sorts of videos, sharing these sorts of stories, sharing testimonies. Uh, Alhamdulillah, the activism has really become, this, this, this activism has been going on for a very long time, but internationally, a lot more attention has been paid recently. I mean, when I say a long time, I've seen a document uh, by like one of the Muslim World League organizations from the 80s, where Muslim right like countries came together and wrote a letter saying, you know, China stop oppressing the Muslims, right? Obviously, it's got a lot worse today, right? So it's been going on for a long time, but now it's much more in the international light. So I think it becomes easier to share different types of media that talk about this. So there is a comic, for example, uh, depicting the life of Mihrigul Tursun, uh, which conveys this, you know, tragedy to people in, I think, a very powerful way. There are academic studies that do this. There are increasing numbers of YouTube videos and, you know, documentary style work being done. So I think there's a wide variety of sources that we can share and, you know, honestly, just uh, repetition, you know, and, and talking to people, sharing these stories is a powerful way to do it. So was the conversion mostly through worse? No. Uh, no, like, I think this is a narrative that often people give. They're like, oh, conversion, like people convert to Islam. Because if we look back in the eighth century, the early eighth century, uh, in the early eighth century, the kind of Umayyad dynasty actually made its way into Kashgar. And they actually conquered that territory for a short period of time in that time period. But Islam did not, it was spread, you know, war, they took over. But Islam did not spread after that time period. Islam really spread beginning, especially in the Karakhan era. Uh, 
So yes, there was, you know, different rulers are conquering different lands, what have you, but even when something is conquered, the people aren't just becoming Muslim. It's more so the kind of gradual acculturation of Islam, the presence of different saints, remembrance around tomb saints, different migrations, these stories kind of spreading that people gradually become Muslim. There are moments of conquest that introduce it to a new area, but it's much more a gradual social process than something that's like, oh, it's war or what have you. Uh, and even then we say, oh, it's spread through war. It's like these very people that converted, you know, are the ones waging war and conquering. And, you know, it's, it's much more complicated. People want to make everything Islamic seem foreign. But as we see, I think we've seen over here, it's something that's simultaneously of the world and of the local variety as well. Uh, are these heritage sites, novels, and cultural acknowledged by UNESCO? Can by any means? How can we know this history? So unfortunately, UNESCO really doesn't have like uh, much power when it comes to protecting these type of things. When we think of Palmyra in Syria, like UNESCO definitely raised a fuss about like Palmyra being devastated in the conflict in Syria, which is definitely a major UNESCO site, one of the most famous Roman, like post whatever sites in the Middle East. Uh, and it really didn't do much. It raised attention because they, they were able to talk about things being looted. And actually in some ways it was kind of sad that people were more willing to talk about the material things that were being looted and destroyed than the peoples themselves that are being destroyed. Uh, so can they protect means? I think like these avenues of like cultural protection, et cetera, can be ways of talking about these types of things for sure. And I think someone else who knows more about the UNESCO connections and what is protected, not protected. Actually, I think a lot of things are listed. You know, there's like world cultural heritage thing, like the 12 Muqams, like different items like that are listed there, but there's no like force. But I think this is a good way to uh, learn about this. So how can we as a non you know, get to know this history? Uh, inshallah, I'll send out a bibliography of various texts. A lot of texts are quite academic, unfortunately. So they, they, sometimes the access can be a little bit difficult. Also, like a lot of work is still being done in this history. There's so many people, uh, so many young academics, so many like popular students who are starting to do work on this, who are translating texts, reading texts. Uh, so, I mean, these are various ways in Salah, what, what Yaakum. Um, just checking uh, somebody the also asked towards the beginning, um, could you recommend a couple of books about East Jerusalem? I think it'll be easier. I'll, I'll send a little bibliography uh, to people rather than butcher people's last names myself, um, inshallah. I think there's a couple of questions in the chat box, not the Q and A. Um, somebody asked, "Can you recommend books to learn about the Chaitai Turks?" The same thing about I'll send a bibliography within a week, inshallah. But also, Tarikhi Rashidi, uh, it's, it's a translated text. I think it's been translated at least once or twice. Um, uh, it was a 16th century text written uh, in Srinagar, in Kashmir, actually. Uh, the ruler was a cousin of Babur, the founder of the Mughals. He was a local ruler in Kashmir who also wrote this text in Chagatai Turkic, where he talked about the sort of Chagatai Khan, like the, the history of the, the Chagatai Mongols. Uh, so it, it, that, that Mongol history and the conversion to Islam, it's all in that story. Uh, and there are other variants of these type of stories, but there's like beautiful details and like little things. When you read one of these pre-modern histories, again, it's very different from histories today they're not so much like this is exactly what happened and we have to be super objective. It's, they're telling stories, right? And they're constructing narratives and identity and moral lessons through these types of histories. But it's, it's really worth a read. It's just a fascinating text. Uh, is it helpful to bring Chinese here and let business establishments know what? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I think there's, a, I think we can talk more about this. There's, uh, you know, in Congress, the discussion about, you know, uh, stopping this, like, you know, forced labor, uh, companies from doing, relying on forced labor. Uh, we've seen, it worked, in uh, South Africa, you know, this boycott and divestment, uh, it's working in Palestine, which is the reason why there's such a push against BDS today. So absolutely it can be helpful over here. I think individuals can make a difference, but also inshallah, if like states actually on, on that higher level also make a difference, I think that can, that can do quite a lot. Uh, yeah, and I think I, I didn't, you're being asked to just share a few points. Um, yeah. Yeah, Babur Rami wrote it in Chagatai, yeah, as uh, what you're saying, he wrote the Babur Rami in Chagatai Turkic. Uh, and it is amazing. So that's also been translated. Uh, the Babur Rami has been translated by Wheeler Thaxton, a beautiful translation. And you can find, I think, pretty easily online, like the Chagatai versions of the text too. It is such a unique text and such a beautiful text. He talks, again, this is like a conqueror for like, he's conquering India, right? And, but he talks so much about fruits. And he talks nonstop about like different fruits and like, you know, Samarkand, the Uzbekistan, where he's from. Uh, and many of these types of fruits he's talking about, like they exist in East Turkestan today. Like everyone loves like melons. Like this is really a land of fruits. And you can imagine because he was from like, like these types of lands, he has this connection for like, the first thing he talks about, about a new place is like, oh, their fruit is like this or that. Like it's an incredible text, like very much like a culinary history and not just a, <laughs> uh, a history of like a conquest. 
Uh, he also talks over, and again, he shows you something about the values of like someone like him, but also of the wider time period. He talks about poetry. Like every time he introduces a new figure, he's like, oh, this person was a, they were a good poet or they're a bad poet, but a good person, you know, because these sort of rhetorical norms and ethical norms, everything's kind of brought together in this time period. Um, I think those are all the questions that have been submitted. Um, uh, somebody asked, uh, also, also somebody just asked on Facebook, um, I have a little question about primary sources in academia. How are scholars accessing materials for studies today? Because I'm, I'm finding fieldwork is impossible. Yeah, so that's really, so some scholars were there, they actually wanted to do fieldwork. For other people, it's impossible today. Um, there are several manuscript libraries that have sources. So the Jarin collection I mentioned in Sweden is perhaps the most well-known, but I think there are other collections in Germany and other places. Uh, that have like a lot of these like manuscripts that are there but again it's not everything we can imagine there are whole archives that are being destroyed uh there are just waves of texts that are being destroyed that we don't know anything about um which again it, it's definitely a challenge how do you write a history how do you tell a history that's being destroyed um i think there is something again very powerful like oral narration i think is really important over here uh, talking about people's works yeah it, as uh, i think really mentions Rianthum's sacred roots of Euler history he was actually able to do field work uh, he did his research before like the ex this most extreme crackdown. So he talks about a lot of these different hagiographies and these different types of works. Uh, but it is, it's difficult. But there are sources that can be found. Uh, there's so many works that have never been like, translated or even in these like collections, there's so many works there that even there have not been fully read. Uh, and that we can return to in new ways, inshallah. Somebody also commented on Facebook that uh, Sean Roberts' War on the Uyghurs book uh, covers the current restrictions by the Chinese regime extensively. Uh, he basically says that being Muslim has been equated to being a uh, quote extremist or a terrorist in East Turkestan. So for those who want to learn more about the current uh, situation, that's another book that you can uh, look into. It's called um, War on the Uyghurs by Sean Roberts. And then there's one more last question uh, by Hussein Ali. How much do you think the Uyghur uprisings or protests do you think contributed to China's current policy? And what were the conditions before the protests? Uh, and the thing is, China will use these protests as an excuse to crack down more, right? But I think one of the big uh, turning points, not just you know, protests and uprisings, but also kind of the shift in discourse globally, where, you know, after the you know, war on terror in America, China began to employ this sort of rhetoric for referring to the, uh, you know, the Oilers and using this to kind of further oppression. And of course, the crackdowns would definitely increase. Like after 2009, of course, crackdowns increased. Uh, but even in the present day, uh, it, it's much more just like changes in like state policy, et cetera, that are causing this then like, oh, they're responding to a protest or an uprising. Yeah, I would say specifically after 2009 is when we started to see the really increased crackdown uh, using surveillance and then uh, slowly the construction of these concentration camps and prisons. Uh, basically, they claim that these protest with these protests that these leaders are prone to extremism, terrorism, and that uh, we need to quote unquote cleanse the virus from the Uyghur people's brains. And that's their basic justification for putting people into these facilities and carrying out this genocide. Um, I think that those are the last of the few questions. And uh, before we conclude today, uh, we wanted, I wanted to give the floor to uh, the Free Uyghur Now Student Coalition that was recently formed. Um, they were also co-sponsors of this event. So Iman and Tasneem, would you guys like to say anything? Yeah, first of all, Salakum everyone. Thank you for coming. And Abdul Rahman, thank you so much for speaking on this issue. It's so important and it was honestly really enlightening to hear about this. So again, thank you. And thank you, Aydin, to being a great moderator and just doing a great job with hosting this event. And Thank you, Justice for All, and Save Leader for being amazing co-sponsors. And if you guys are interested in learning more about us, we're a student coalition. You can follow us at Free Uyghur Now on Instagram or Twitter, and just DM us if you're interested. Thank you. And a quick note for this coalition, mashallah, was started by a group of uh, non-Uyghur students at Yale and then UMD, and then has slowly spread to universities across the United States. And mashallah, they have grown on social media, I think with over 25,000 followers on Instagram, and they have constant action items that they're posting and information infographics that are really helpful uh, for the younger generations that are active on social media. So please take use of that and, um, you know, and, and 
uh, just, just, uh, it just for me, it's at least touching to see that these initiatives have been taken uh, because for a while I felt, I feel like a lot of us Uyghurs felt like we were the only ones doing work um, or trying to get this issue out there. And alhamdulillah, now you can see, we can see that this, is, this uh, issue is now being, um, you know, is actively being worked on by um, uh, passionate people around the world, including this group. So Jazakallah khair for everyone for joining us today. I uh, hope you guys learned a lot and uh, this, inshallah, this, we do have a recording on this. So for those who want to uh, rewatch it or watch it later again, uh, you can, or for those who, I'm sorry, for those who haven't watched it, who want to watch it later, they can uh, go back and, and go through the PowerPoint, inshallah. So uh, again, thank you guys so much for joining and uh, we'll see you guys next time.